Hey guys, you know there's a thinly veiled way of preaching law, where you no longer talk about God bringing judgment on believers, but you tell them that God is going to be disappointed with them if they do certain things. I call it the disappointed God law preacher. This is usually a preacher who thinks he's preaching grace, but he is not. It's a way to regulate people's behavior without actually preaching law verbatim, but they're not actually preaching the gospel. If God ever had any disappointment with you whatsoever, it would have been totally wrapped up and dealt with in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross once and for all. But let me tell you that God was never disappointed with you to begin with because he never, ever, ever was resting any of his expectancy in your performance to begin with. Your relationship with God is not based on your performance. It's resting on Christ's performance. Jesus did at times become indignant with his disciples and God would express disappointment with people in Scripture. In fact, he would express hot wrath with people in Scripture. But it was never actually at those people themselves. It was always at the, the, the sin itself because of what sin does to his people. It, it, that, and that sin was never something that took God by surprise. And he just got angry one day and got all worked up. Okay, He was the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. He saw all, all your sins before they ever happened and he took care of them before they ever happened. He's taken care of sin and disappointment from time immemorial. God's wrath was never this separate entity entity apart from his love, this other schizophrenic side of God where he partly loves and partly hates. God doesn't love, God is love. And even his wrath is just an extension of his love. His wrath is a big fat no against sin itself because of what sinfulness does to destroy and molest the children he loves. God is love, and his wrath is actually for you. It has never been against you. His wrath destroys everything that holds us back from love. If ever his wrath seemed to be aimed at a person or persons in Scripture, it is only a wrath aimed at that delusional identity of the false self, that old Adamic man, that old nature, someone who was operating as a son of Satan because they didn't know in reality that we are children of God. And that's why there's so many name changes in Scripture. God is always trying to convince us of who we really are and how pleased he is with us in Christ, okay? We do not refrain from sin in order to keep from disappointing God. We refrain from sin because sin has its own negative, destructive consequences in and of itself. It is impossible to truly prosper, enjoy every area of life if we're living in sin. Sin only holds a deceptive, fleeting semblance of temporary pleasure that's not really true. And the problem is that the people and, and preachers, they want to preach sin management rather than the gospel. But paradoxically, only the gospel is the thing that's ever going to work. A good indication that a preacher doesn't have a clue about the gospel is when he's always harping about your part to play. And he's always trying to, quote, balance out the grace message. Jesus did his part. What's your part to play? It's not my part plus God's part. Okay, you actually see this is a question that gets posed in a lot of supernatural or faith-oriented ministries. They always try to hyper-emphasize your part or your delegated authority. And we do have delegated authority, but there's this overemphasis. They rightly don't want to blame God for problems. Problems in this world have to originate from us. And so they focus on our responsibility to fix the world, bring the kingdom, etc. Jesus did his part. He extended grace. Now, if you're not seeing breakthrough, you're not doing your part. Again, look, yes, I agree. Sin inhibits us from seeing a full manifestation of the glory. But it was never, ever Jesus' part plus my part. It was never Jesus plus me. That is a gross understanding of the gospel. And as a matter of fact, it is an anti-gospel, anti-Christ message.
All right. And, and as a matter of fact, it's a gross misunderstanding of covenant relationship. Covenant relationship is not me plus my wife. It's the two have become one. There is no longer me and my wife. We are one. Divorce isn't even on the table. Okay. In the same way, I'm in covenant with God, but he never, ever, ever expected me to fulfill my side of the covenant relationship. Jesus stepped in. He fulfilled the covenant for for me, as me. Jesus Christ in the incarnation became my human response to the Father. So life is no longer Jesus plus me. That's not what co-laboring is all about. That's not what the New Testament is all about. Co-laboring is simply Jesus operating through me. Jesus as me. I have been co-crucified with Christ. There is no me. It is no longer I but Christ. Ha! This is the scandal <laughs> of the gospel. This is what keeps the gospel separate from every other morality system religion on the face of the planet. This is a mystical exchange has taken place. It is him who lives and moves and does his will and good pleasure through me. I'm simply a vessel that contains him. I'm a container, a temple that houses him. I'm just a branch that passively bears the, the, the sap of the vine. It bears fruit. The, the realization that my old sinful self doesn't even exist, it's dead, that's what causes a manifestation of holy living because dead men don't sin. But if I'm always trying to be holy and fulfill my part and I talk about my responsibility, that's self-dependence, that's not gospel, and I will ultimately fall on my face. <laughs> or give a nice little external Christian happy smile on Sunday morning while inside I'm seething at the bit. So here's the thing. Aside from my total utter dependence on God for a holy life, I am also utterly dependent on Him to operate in the supernatural. It's not about your efforts to work miracles, change your situation, change your atmosphere, God is sovereign. Now, praise God that I can rest and I can trust in his sovereignty. And sure, I may pray at times, I may declare something, you know, whatever, as I feel led. And I may be felt led a lot, but it's still Christ manifesting through me, not me separate from him helping him out. And at the end of the day, God is not depending on me for any of this stuff. He's not dependent on me for evangelism. He's not dependent on me for healing, etc., etc. Thank God that the Great Commission is not resting on our shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> the world would surely be going to hell in a handbasket. Look, I just get to play and I get to participate. But when I know the burden has been taken off of me, that the, the government's on his shoulders, and I get this idea that God's no longer disappointed in my crappy performance, then that's when I actually might start to bear some fruit and see hundreds of thousands of souls coming into the kingdom and that kind of stuff. That's when fruit bubbles up, is when it's no longer I but Christ. That revelation's manifesting. Now let me address something on the flip side here, okay? Yeah, ultimately, the miraculous, all this stuff, it's about the sovereignty of God. But in the name of sovereignty, you have another group of people over here who will blame sickness and disease and poverty and rape and destruction and evil on God. They say God's sovereign, he's in control, so you just have to deal with it. All that comes from him too, right? And you got to be careful because this is, this is a cessationist type of grace teaching. And the cessationists actually have preached grace a little bit better than, than charismatics and Pentecostals over the years, but this is where they really miss it, okay? God is sovereign, but he is not evil, all right? I want to present a mystery to you. Two things that you need to always hold in tension. One, God is good, and also God is sovereign. These two seem to come at odds at times, but it is, it is a divine mystery. I can always trust sickness, poverty, divorce. These kind of things don't come from God because he is goodness itself. At the same time, if I'm not seeing some breakthrough in some area of, of, of healing or whatever, I don't have to go and twist God's arm and pump my own little faith meter up to red hot in order to get him to intervene. Okay, I don't take matters into my own hands if I'm not manifesting breakthrough. Even if I never see victory over cancer or something like that in my life, I could still trust God that in his sovereignty, even though he's good and doesn't want me to be sick, he's sovereign and he will one day bring restoration, even if it's in my new body, which is ultimately what you're going to be in for billions and billions of years. All right, God is good and God is sovereign. A lot of people preach grace, 
but they don't have this substance necessarily of seeing manifestations of supernatural stuff or joy. A lot of grace preachers are just talking doctrine, and I mean, that's a fact. And grace, let me tell you, is not a doctrine. Grace is the very essence, the very substance of God himself. What does grace look like? It looks like favor. All of these crazy descriptions that charismatics get excited about in the, in the Gospels. The favor of God that was on Solomon. He's filthy, stinking rich. He's got favor with his adversaries. Job, in his early days and in his latter days, the favor of God. All of his possessions doubled. All of his family in, in good shape in the end. Uh, uh, it means, you know, favor of God. Getting the best parking spots. Walking in tangible blessing. That's favor. Did you know that is also what grace is? Grace is not just a doctrine. It's tangible sub substance on our lives. And we who preach grace should be the ones who are actually working the most miracles of all. We're the ones who are touting God's goodness. In scripture, it's his glory and his goodness are the same exact thing. Moses said, show me your glory, but the scripture says it was his goodness that passed by in front of him. So his tangible shing ding ding, his glory is his goodness. If somebody's not walking in miracles, they're not seeing breakthrough in their lives. Look, it's not a blame game either because that's jumping back on the other side of the fence. It doesn't mean that the message of grace is somehow wrong. It doesn't mean they've taken grace too far. They're not seeing enough miracles. Now they should be doing something to make those miracles happen. Look, it probably just it could mean that your expectancy is in the wrong place. And if you, you know, if you expect to be poor and broke and sick your whole life and you think that's just God's portion for you and you're preaching a gospel of postponement, you know, in the future I'll be blessed in heaven, you know, or, or you know, that I've got to pull heaven down. Well, what do you think you're going to manifest? Let it be according to your faith. Uh, and we're not saying you got to drum up faith either. Either Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The good news. What is the good news? Let's just keep it simple. Preaching the good news. It's the good news that God has fully included you in the divine life here and now. Your death is not the doorway to heaven. His death was the doorway to heaven. You don't enter heaven one day when you die. You entered heaven 2,000 years ago when he died. There's nothing holding you back right now from experiencing your inheritance. Yes, I have complete access right now. No, I may not realize that deep, deep down inside. But yes, one day I can trust that I will fully realize in manifest the goodness of his glory and no I don't have to try to work it up pump it up make it happen a certain way right now negative things are not a sign of God's wrath or disappointment with me or that I'm not getting the job done although they may be the result of wrong ways of believing or stupid actions not necessarily are they so in matter of fact it, it, I, all I should do is expect the best every day. Don't lose your joy. Don't lose your buzz every day. You are plugged into heaven. If I see sickness, brokenness, etc., I don't blame God for evil. And I don't expect evil to come and hit me tomorrow. I can just say that is not my portion. He finished the job. If I don't see some kind of breakthrough, I'm not going to go try to help him finish the job. I see breakthrough as he proclaims the completed victory through me. God bless you guys. See you next week. Hey guys, real quickly, I want to tell you about our Losing My Religion Tour. This is coming to four regions of the country this spring, and I would encourage you all to come. It's going to be David Vaughn from the UK, as well as myself. Each stop is going to be two full days of wild glory party, impartation, grace teaching on the finished work of the cross. Of course, you can drink at home all by yourself and not come, but there's something to that pilgrimage to go gather together in a corporate canopy of whack. And I'm anticipating a real supernatural explosion. So come with expectancy. If you need healing, financial breakthrough, miracles, faith comes by hearing. And there will be a tangible atmosphere as we drink together of his glorious grace. Our only stop in the entire southeast is going to be in Atlanta. So if you're anywhere in Georgia, Florida, the Carolinas, Tennessee, come. Expect the Lord to blast you with some revelation that brings manifestation. All our Atlanta area partners, hey, bring your friends, those who need a drink. This is our only visit to the area for the entire year. So if you're anywhere also in the New England area, New York, Upper East Coast, come join us outside of Boston in Haverhill, Mass. This is going to be our only New England stop for the entire year. And our third stop 
on the Losing My Religion Tour will be Chicago. All of you in the Great Lakes area, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, come to Chicago. And finally, we're going to hit the Southwest. Everybody in Texas, cowboy country, well worth your time. Stampede over. We're going to be in Houston. So, four stops, Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Houston. It's all coming up in May. Don't delay. Tell your friends now. It's going to be a massive gathering of drunken gospel believers from all over the world. We've got people flying in internationally for these things. These trips with Dave often pack out. So, sign up today at www.losingreligion.eventbrite.com. We will see you in May. In addition to the tour, we would also invite you to come to a mystical school. These are our three-day intensives, a real marriage between supernatural impartation and activation in the grace message. If you're anywhere in the Midwest, come to our Nebraska school in Omaha in April, and also we'll be in Canada and London, Ontario. So all of you Canadians, come out for that one next month. We'll also be coming to Ohio to the Bread Basket this June in Canton, so join us there. Also, our first ever school in Montana will be in Bozeman this June, so if you're anywhere up in that region, please join us and we'll be in the UK in Scotland for our Edinburgh Mystical School. Also this summer we'll be in Southern California for a mystical school in Riverside and finally we'll be in Germany. Now all of our mystical schools overseas are quickly filling up our international ones so sign up soon we'll see you there.